What's cracking guys, in this video I'm covering this new paper called uh, The Sensory Neuron as a Transformer Permutation Invariant Neural Networks for Reinforcement Learning by Jujing Tang and David Ha from Google Brain. So uh, the idea is to create an agent uh, that will be able, or a framework that will be able to uh, solve a problem like this one. So you have a RL like uh, environment here, like this uh, car racing uh, game, and the goal is to be able to to play the game even though the observation was severely shuffled. So we had some certain uh, type of permutation being applied to the input observation. So as you can see here, uh, this is our input. This is your uh, the original car racing game, and then you divide this uh, like uh, observation into patches, like a grid of patches, and then you do arbitrary permutation, and you get something like this, and you still want to preserve the the performance that the agent had previously. So obviously, if we took something like the DQN agent, like that's one of the most famous and one of the first successful. Um, like uh, RL agents that were able to play these types of games, uh, you, you, if you know how it works, you know that it's gonna fail miserably here because it, it was uh, if you learn how to play uh, on this observation, it's using CNN in the background, remember, and so uh, it's gonna completely uh, crash here because the uh, like initial structure, the original structure, uh, the spatial structure that this observation had uh, is not is no longer present here, so it's gonna fail. Uh, if you haven't watched my DKM video, do check it out. I'm going to link it somewhere here. Uh, so how they managed to achieve this is there are two components to this. So the first component is this, uh, they, they borrow ideas from this self-organization literature. And the second idea is to uh, add the permutation invariance, uh, like to bake it in into the model. And uh, that way they achieve the, this, this behavior I just explained. So um, let's see what I say here. Uh, numerous studies have demonstrated that humans can adapt to changes in, in sensory inputs even when they are fed into the wrong channels. But difficult adaptations such as learning to see by interpreting visual information emitted from a grid of electrodes placed on one's tongue or learning to ride a backward bicycle require months of training to achieve mastery. So, uh, I mean, just the pure fact that humans are able to do this is fairly mind-blowing. So this first thing, learning to see through the tongue, is you basically have like a camera, I guess, and that camera approximately contains the same information as what your eye sensor would receive. And so you just take the electrodes, so the information coming from that RGB camera, you place it on someone's tongue, and the like neuro pl neural plasticity of the brain does the rest after obviously long, 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 like uh, multiple months of training. But you can learn how your brain can learn and your neurons can adapt, like uh, to form a circuit that can understand the image even though it's coming from a different channel. So that's like tongue. So that's something called sensory substitution. Like check out this video from uh, Getting Smarter Every Day where you have this backward bike and the goal, the, the idea is that the input observation is kind of permuted. That means means that you try to turn the bar left, but the wheel turns right. So you have this discrepancy, this, this shuffling that happened, and all of a sudden nobody can actually ride that bike, even though you know how to, to, to ride the normal bike. And so I guess there is an analogy between that and this thing here, it's just that this is a bit more complex. Uh, and you can imagine we, we couldn't be able to play this without severe, like a lot of training. So check out this uh, short clip. Where I work, the welders are geniuses and they like to play jokes on the engineers. He had a challenge for me. He had built a special bicycle and he wanted me to try to ride it. He had only changed one thing. When you turn the handlebar to the left, the wheel goes to the right. When you turn it to the right, the wheel goes to the left. I thought this would be easy, so I hopped on the bike ready to demonstrate how quickly I could conquer this. And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Destin Stanley. First attempt riding the bicycle. Alright. So, the faster I go, the better. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't do it. You can see that I'm laughing, but I'm actually really frustrated. In this moment, I had a really deep revelation. My thinking was in a rut. This bike revealed a very deep truth to me. I had the knowledge of how to operate the bike, but I did not have the understanding. Okay, so now the question is, can we do better? Uh, and create AI systems that can rapidly adapt to sensory sub substitutions without the need to be retrained. Can, can we, can we uh, avoid the need to retrain the network in order to complete this task? So even humans need months to adapt to this uh, novel task. So this paper is in a way trying to go even above the human intelligence, at least in this very particular uh, domain. Um, one more interesting idea I want to 
I want to like read out here and then um, I'm going to dig into the paper is this. In complex systems, we often observe complex global behavior emerge from a collection of agents interacting with each other in their environment. With each individual agent acting only on locally available information without no knowing the full picture. So uh, there are systems such as, uh, they mentioned here an implementation of these systems such as cellular automata, where basically all of the cells, so all of the components of the system only have access to a local information and um, then they are able to somehow communicate and form this global representation, this global complex behavior. Uh, if you don't know what cellular automata is, check out this short video. So basically every single cell uh, consults the neighbors and uses their information to update its own information and every single cell does that for uh, itself and then you, you have this global uh, like uh, behavior emerging which is pretty amazing. So a uh, similar idea was applied in this paper basically every single one of these patches will be uh, fed into a, like a unique uh, neural network all of them will be identical the weights will be shared but like still we have a, like a single neural network will have access to only a, like a local information so for to, to a single patch and we somehow need to integrate that information into a global representation which can then be fed into some policy network uh, of an RL agent and then the agent can learn how to play this thing. So the second important component you want to bake in into this model is that no matter the permutation of the patches in the case of these visual games, uh, you want to have the same global representation. So that means we, we need to have some kind of a permutation invariance baked in. The way this paper achieves it is using some the idea from the set transformer paper. Now let me let me break it down and explain all of that. Okay, so. Here it is. So the set transformer cleverly replaced Q, and again, uh, I'm gonna assume you know what uh, QKV is. It's a like a terminology from the original transformer paper. If you're not familiar with it, just check out my uh, transformer video. So uh, they replaced the Q with a set of learnable seed vectors. So it's no longer a function of input X, thus enabling the output to become PI or permutation invariant. So uh, before I dig into this uh, chart here and explain uh, how exactly did they accomplish uh, like the permutation invariance, let me quickly explain the difference between uh, permutation equivariance and permutation invariance. So they mentioned it here uh, using these uh, like formulas, basically uh, this property needs to be obeyed if you want to have this. This is by definition what uh, permutation invariance is all about. So you have some input x. You do some permutation over that input x. So that's you can treat it as a list of tokens. And then once you index it with this s, s is just a permutation of this uh, list here. And you basically index x, which means which is a maybe a NumPy notation. I I don't know if this is uh, like a, I've never seen this uh, notation in math notebooks. But basically, what you do here is you're permuting the input x uh, according to this uh, like uh, list s. And once you pass that to function f, you want to make sure that it's the same as the original, like as passing the original input. So no matter the permutation you apply to the input, you get the same output. That's the permutation invariance. Uh, and on the other hand, we have, and as you can see here, the interesting thing here is that the input space dimensionality does not have to be the same as the output space dimensionality. On the other hand, if we have uh, permutation equivariance, the, those two have to match. So we, we got to have n both in the input space as well as in the output space. So here is the formula for, for permutation equivariance, as you can see here. So now once we permute the input, uh, what happens is because we have the equivariance part, basically the output is going to permute in the same manner. So uh, the original transformer paper had exactly this property and all of the transformers is, except for the set transformer have this property. So basically let me try and explain it really quickly. So let's say we have um, three input tokens. So a red token, we have a green token and we have a blue token. 
So we pass them into the transformer layer. So we have like a black box here. This is going to do the transformer magic and out comes uh, some novel representations. So I'm just gonna denote them as this double bar red and then, uh, so let me take the green one, double bar green. So that's some novel representation and finally, the blue one. So uh, the, the reason why transformers are uh, permutation equivariant is because if we Im imagine I'm just going to permute this input now like this. So we're going to have uh, red here, we're going to have green here, and we're going to have blue remain on the same position. So what is now going to happen is that we're just going to permute the output the same way as we permuted the input. So that's what this formula here is telling us. Uh, basically, that's what transformers are going to do by default. So we're going to have the following thing. We're going to have uh, green will be here, red will be here, and blue will be here. Okay. Okay. So let me make the permutation explicit. So we have we have this is the original like ordering of the inputs one two three. What we did here is we put two here because two corresponds to green one. Then we had one. Then we had three. So this is the permutation we applied to the input. So now what this formula tells us is that uh, passing this permuted input through H, and this is H in our case, so I just denoted T, T is our H. Uh, so passing this uh, in the input, so this novel permutation, so that means this thing here should be the same as passing as, as passing the original input. So that means this one here, passing it as the, so the output of that thing is gonna be this thing. And then we apply the the permutation. So that means we permute this thing like this. So we're gonna take the, the second output, which is this, and put it in the first place. We're gonna take the first output and put it in the second place. <laughs> we're gonna take the third output and just leave it where it is. And as you can see, we get exactly this output here. So hopefully uh, this was clear, maybe a bit confusing, but yeah, uh, this is the, the this is the permutation equivariance. So now what we're trying to accomplish is instead of having this uh, the outputs uh, being permuted the same way as the inputs, we want to have them remain fixed. So that means, for example, we want to have this type of arrangement, no matter how we permute the input. In this case, we'll have like three factorial type, uh, like. Uh, possibilities to permute the input and we'll always have this output. So that would be the permutation invariance. Now, one more important detail between permutation equivariance and invariance is that in the case of equivariance, uh, the like the number of input tokens, uh, and I'm going to use the terminology from transformers, uh, has to be the same as the number of output tokens. Whereas once you have the permutation invariance, you can have, for example, arbitrary number of tokens here like n, and you can still keep this at maybe, I don't know, like five, whatever. So uh, that's another important detail. And we'll soon see why that is important. Basically, um, we can, some of the patches of the input patches, we can kind of um, omit them and uh, the agent will still be able to play the game. Nice. Now let me try to explain uh, how the set transformer idea uh, comes along here. So, um, this is the input uh, token. These are the input tokens. So you have, in the case of the image, uh, all of these will be just uh, like a, a single patch. So this uh, OT means observation at time T, and we are taking patch number one, and we are feeding them into these sensory neurons. So as I said, these are going to be shared. So that's the idea borrowed from the self-organization literature. You basically have uh, like this uh, network weights are gonna be shared across every single one of sensory neurons. And basically, as you can see, every sensory neuron will have as an input just a local information. So just in the case of images, just a couple of pixels in that single patch. So um, what will happen is all of them is, are gonna generate the keys and the value vectors. So that's your usual uh, transformer uh, thing. And then instead of generating query vectors as well, we decouple that part, we decouple this part as you can see from the input. So that means that this Q matrix is just going to be like a fixed embedding, like a like an embedding table. You can think of it this way. Like imagine we have just three vectors here, okay? And that means that um, if you know how transformers work, that means that we're always going to have uh, three vectors at the output here. So this message will have constant format of three vectors like this, no matter the number of inputs. So the, no, no matter the number of patches we input, we're always going to have three vectors as the output because that's dictated by the Q matrix. Let me now try and explain why this thing is permutation invariant. So if we take this particular query vector, this one here, and we do a dot product with all of the keys here. So we'll end up with, with coefficients alpha one, alpha two, 
all the way through alpha n, okay? And we're going to have uh, value vectors, uh, basically v1, v2, all the way through vn. And uh, as you remember, as you recall, we just do multiplication between the attention uh, coefficients and the value vectors. We add them up and we form the message here. So because of the addition, that's, that's the part that enables us the permutation invariance. So e now imagine I just permute, I randomly permute the input observation. So what will happen is that uh, the key vectors will be randomly permuted as well as the value vector. So maybe, uh, so then after we apply this, uh, query, after we do the dot product between query and those uh, new keys and new value vectors, I mean the new order of the keys and values, we'll just have this, 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 the, the following thing. So basically, let's imagine we have something like this, alpha two, alpha one all the way through alpha n. And because the value vectors are going to be permuted the same in the same manner, we'll just have v2, v1 all the way through vn. And now again, because we're just doing multiplication between these and just adding them up, we're gonna end up with the same result. And that's why we have permutation invariance. So basically by doing this, we bake in, by, by design, we bake in this permutation invariance property into our neural network. So we don't ha do not have to learn how to handle different permutations of the inputs. Okay, and um, basically on a high level, what will happen with all of these agents, and they tested these agents on four different games, is we're gonna input the observation, we're gonna input the, the previous action, we're gonna pass them through this attention neuron, so this is this whole pipeline we just saw here, we're gonna form the message, we're gonna have some policy uh, function here, and we're gonna output actions, the next action that, we'll, that we'll, we will use uh, to interact with the environment. Okay, uh, having explained this, uh, like how this thing works, um, I'm just gonna make a small remark here. So these here are sensory neurons and the whole thing is called attention neuron. So I'm just gonna go back to the title. Uh, the title name was the sensory neuron as a transformer. And I think this part should be attention neuron, I guess, because uh, that's where the transformer like uh, attention uh, happens and not on the sensory neuron level. But uh, yeah, and anyways, uh, super small knit. I may be off here. Let's get back to the paper, okay. So um, quick notice here. So everything I just explained visually uh, is just uh, captured here algebraically. Basically, uh, what will happen is every one of these sensory neurons is gonna, from the observation, is gonna create its own uh, key, is gonna create its own value. And as you can see here, the inputs uh, are a bit different. The key function will be accepting the observation. So this, like the ith component, as well as the previous action, whereas the value uh, like functions will only be accepting the observations. And now, now I guess the, the reason for that is you do not want to bias the uh, like current action with the previous one because uh, remember how this thing works is you're gonna ha just have in the this message which is just going to contain like a sum, a weighted sum of value vectors. And so these value vectors will not have uh, like the previous action uh, like uh, incorporated into them. And so that means we won't won't be biasing the um, the current action at this time step. So I, I may be completely wrong here, but I think that's that's the reason they omitted the uh, last action for the value function here. Uh, finally, this is just the transformer formalism. The important thing to notice here is that the Q does not have uh, any input, and uh, that's the way we achieve the permutation invariance. And the second thing is they decoupled uh, like the Q matrices with this WQs, which is not usually done because once you apply the WQs, you actually get the queries and the keys and the values. So here they just decouple this to to make this formalism a bit more uh, clear, I guess. But again, if you understood the what I explained here, uh, you don't need to worry about the formulas. Okay, so a um, couple more things. They, they have four experiments. Um, they have these non-vision continuous control tasks like the, this, this uh, like card pull swing up and they also have vision-based tasks like the pong game and the car race game. And I'm gonna switch to blog and show you the animations and then I'm gonna return back to the paper and uh, show you the, the results they got. Okay, here we are. Uh, basically we have a, like a, this card pull uh, problem. It's a very famous toy problem in the RL field. Uh, you're trying to just uh, basically uh, make sure that this card is at the x equals zero position along this x-axis and you're trying to make sure that the 
theta angle equals zero, that means that this bar, the pole, is vertical. And so what will now happen, as, we, as you can see here, these are the observations. So we have five, we'll have five sensory neurons, while one will be processing at this point, uh, like this theta uh, dot, which is angular velocity, then we have cosine and sine of theta, we have the x velocity, and we have the x position. Uh, because of the way this uh, agent is implemented, and that's using LSTM for the sensory uh, neurons, that means once I click shuffle observation, it will take some time for the hidden state of the LSTM to recover and understand which input it's parsing and that's what well, we have a small transition once I hit this and then we'll, the, the agent will still manage to, to achieve the performance and to balance the pole. So let me, let me click uh, shuffle observations. Okay, so nothing happened, there was just some small glitch there. Let me touch it again. So this time it failed but it's gonna manage to balance it out again. So that's one example, uh, the non-visual task they, they, were, they were using in their experiments. Uh, there is, this is the second uh, uh, experiment they've, de they've done, and that's using the Pong game. And as you can see here, aside from shuffling, they also mask certain, uh, patch like certain patches out. And uh, you can imagine this would be super hard for a human to play. Uh, and uh, the agent actually uh, manages to, 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 to play it really well. Uh, masking out the, uh, the patches is possible because of the M versus N, so the input and the output space do not have to be the same. That means we can change the number of uh, like uh, components of the observation at the input and we're still going to have the same message uh, at the output and the policy will be able to handle it. So that's why we can handle these uh, black patches. So yeah, aside from that we have uh, like the car race game and they showed that uh, they can that their agent can actually handle different backgrounds even though the, the agent never saw these, these different backgrounds during the training. And uh, the reason it can achieve that is because the uh, representation that this uh, like model uh, like uh, constructs is basically abstra abstracts out the background as a not important information to play this game. But we'll get back to, to those details a bit later. Uh, this is just for you to understand and have a clear picture of uh, the tasks they were using in, this, in, in their experiments. Now quickly getting back to the paper, let, let's digest the results they got. So this is the carpool, uh, like a static image. And again, kudos to the authors for making this uh, interactive demos uh, in their blog. I think that's the, 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 the way forward because PDFs are such an obsolete format in my honest opinion. But yeah, um, okay, so let's see the results they, they achieve. They have two baselines. First is fully connected neural network uh, with five observations. The second one is fully connected neural network with 10 observations. So these fives are recalled that we had like the x, the uh, the velocity, we had the theta, the angular velocity, etc. So those are the five observations. These baselines will be just, you just input uh, the uh, five observations into a fully connected layer. You get a intermediate hidden representation. You, you pass it to another a fully connected layer and out comes the output. So these are these baselines. And uh, the this hours is just, instead of using uh, here a feed forward network, we're gonna use this attention neuron we just developed. So this is going to be attention neuron component here. Attention neuron, okay? So these are the models we are comparing with. And as you can see here uh, on the five observations, uh, it's a bit, it's lagging a little bit behind the baseline. And obviously we have uh, like no answer here because uh, we cannot plug in uh, five observations into this neural network which is expecting 10 observations. So that's the, uh, the another con of these baselines. They are not flexible, they are not adaptable to the uh, variation of the number of inputs. So the reason there is a small lag here is because they're using LSTM, so it takes some time to, to build up to understand the input that the that particular sensory neuron is, is parsing. And uh, now it makes me wonder whether we can just use, uh, instead of LSTMs, just use the fully connected network and achieve better results here. I'm not sure I saw in the paper like some ablation like that one, and I guess it should work since this thing is working already. Uh, I don't see why this wouldn't work. But yeah, anyways, uh, the, the, the point here is that once we shuffle the observations, uh, this thing completely fails, and the attention neuron model uh, doesn't have any problems dealing with shuffled uh, like inputs. Then uh, expanding to 10 observations, which is proving the point that this model can handle varying number of inputs, you can see that the result is still uh, like holds here. Here we don't have an answer because this is, as I said, five observations and we, we can only test the 10 observation uh, fully connected neural network. And again, it's lagging a little bit behind it. Uh, finally, the interesting column for me is this one because um, instead of adding uh, 
and instead of dupli duplicating the, the five uh, input observations, this time they actually uh, add random Gaussian noise and the, the query vector somehow learn to ignore that information and only uh, focus on the actual uh, signals. And so basically, if I go, if I scroll back to this chart, uh, that means that these query vectors are learned such that even though we have, even though that like a half of these observations are like pure noise, it will learn how to ignore these. And so I guess the, 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 the corresponding attention coefficients uh, will be super small. And so the value vectors will be small that were emitted from these observations. And so the message will be constructed only from the, mostly from, from the useful signal uh, parts of the observation and not the noise. And that's fairly, fairly intriguing property that, that, that happened there. Uh, on this diagram, they just visually present how the message, so the, uh, the uh, global representation is the same. So basically, in the case of uh, card pool, uh, this empty vector, so let me, let me scroll back here. So this empty is just a 16 dimensional uh, like a vector, and they just plot it here. So this here, at, you pick one time step, and this will be the empty at that time step. And as you can see here, these two plots are the same, which is nice because uh, here we, we don't have the observation shuffling and here we have the observation shuffling and the message remains the same, which means this is just a visual presentation of the, of the uh, permutation invariance property. Uh, okay, uh, uh, so I already showed you uh, the demos and uh, you, there is just, they just did a bit more, um, they, they were very thorough with these experiments. So what they did is they did this uh, training occlusion ratio. They, they, they changed it from zero to 0 0.9, which means zero means you, you don't have any occlusion. So all of the, the patches are actually uh, contain, contain the signal. They're not uh, like blacked out. And uh, 0 0.9 means 90% of these patches will be blacked out. And so training the agent across that range and then testing it again on various uh, ratios of occlusion, you can see an interesting pattern emerging here. So we, we definitely see the best results for 50%. And so as a quick reminder, uh, for the game of Pong, uh, 21 is the top score you can achieve. So you're that you have two paddles here, you're playing the game and you can uh, once the, the ball uh, gets past your opponent, that's plus one for you and you can, you can get until 21. So because these are averages, um, 21 means you're pretty much constantly uh, winning the game. And so, as you can see here, until we get to approximately 50% occlusion in the test, we are performing really well, uh, and then it drops. It seems that the agents are struggling if we have too much occlusion during training. But this this one, this one is, they mentioned this uh, example here, and it's interesting uh, because when you, when you basically train with 80% occlusion, and then you show all of the patches in the test time, uh, you can see that it's still on pair with the opponent, meaning that on average, it's even a bit better than the opponent when you have all of the patches, which means it can, um, leverage the additional information and generalize uh, to it, even though it did not have it during uh, the, the training uh, time. Okay, they also analyze the representations they get from this uh, attention neuron. So we just, what they do is they take the empty vector, they just uh, apply TSNE, and they just project uh, the empty to two dimensional space. <clears throat> so if we take uh, like outputs which are close to each other, so empty is projected nearby in the 2D space, we can see that the corresponding inputs that led to that MT being projected here are fairly similar. So here you can see that this, uh, I guess this is called pad or pedal, uh, is all the way down. And in all of these inputs, so basically this is a single input. This whole row is a single input because again, it would be helpful if you knew how DQM works. Uh, especially when you're dealing with these Atari games, what you do, you stack four consecutive frames uh, to avoid having this uh, perceptual al aliasing, whereby you do not know if you see a single image, whether the ball is going in this direction or that direction or that direction, so you do not know the state. Once you concatenate a couple of frames, you have uh, like a less uh, like a va vagueness, let's call it that way, uh, in your input. So you can see that the inputs are, are visually and semantically similar and they are grouped here into the same uh, like part of this 2D space here. Uh, you can imagine once you have this type of representation, uh, the agent can learn how to, to make good decisions and play, play, play the game of Pong. Okay, uh, I mentioned this, showed you, I showed you this in the blog. Uh, basically, uh, the cool thing is that the 
uh, like our this model, the attention neuron manages to to cope with different types of backgrounds. So they they tried four different backgrounds here uh, plus the shuffling, and they showed that the like agent still can play the game because it's ignoring uh, that irrelevant information, which is the background in this case. And uh, they they plotted on this diagram here the attention so how they construct these representations is remember these are patches so this this is going to be your input it you're going to pass it to the sensory neuron and it's going to emit the key uh, and so once you, you you take your query you just do dot product with all of the keys and you can see that these here uh, get the most attention, which is basically the like the the curve, the turning. So, and me and you as humans, we can uh, we can notice that these are very important because once you take the features that correspond to these patches and you combine them into the message, and then uh, you can basically. Um, use that feature, that novel global representation to make a good decision and that's to turn left in this case. Uh, similarly here, even though they swapped uh, the background, so the original background is this green, uh, like a grass type of thing, uh, once you swap it with this random background, the, the model still learns how to uh, pay attention to the relevant parts of the image and so it knows when to turn. I think that's pretty much it. Uh, there is one more interesting thing here and that's uh, they not only shuffle the input observation, they do that dynamically during the, the game. So every, for example, t equals 25 steps, they shuffle the input observation and they uh, do that from 25, 50 all the way to 500 and no reshuffle. And we can see the results here are pretty pretty nice. So looking at the car racing, uh, the, the performance drops somewhat, same as for a card pool, but for different reasons. So here we have the LSTM, so it takes some time to update the hidden state. Here they have some different strategy. They are using some difference between the the, 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 the neighboring frames. And so once you do the uh, like a shuffle, uh, that means that that difference is going to have a is going to introduce an error into the model, and that's it's going to struggle uh, like uh, until it uh, stabilizes again. So there are a bunch of details. Uh, they did a very nice and thorough experimentations across different games. You can check out the blog yourself and the interactive demos, but basically the main ideas are uh, to have this type of sharing uh, between sensory neurons and to add the, the set transformer idea so that we have the permutation invariance and so that we can shuffle the observation and still preserve the same MT upon which we are building the policy network. So I haven't been focusing obviously on the RL component because that's just um, not the, the, the core insight behind this paper. They were also using evolutionary, evolutionary strategy algorithms to basically train the agents, but the main idea was to test whether the agents can be more robust to permutation, to random shuffling of the input uh, observations. So hopefully you found this video useful. If you did, share it out with a friend, uh, subscribe to this channel, join the Discord community. There is a lot of cool uh, conversations happening there. Uh, people are uh, helping each other out. So do join it. And until next time, bye bye.